And here they come. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We'll get Good morning. started. Good morning. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey. We'll get started in just a minute. Wait just a second in case anyone else is joining. Good morning, good morning. All right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I have about 1030 on my um, computer right now, so we'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning um, for our fourth and final uh, session on the cross-check method. Um, today we are talking about the cross-check method and written and oral communications. So we are going to dive right in. Our purpose for today is to improve understanding of the written and oral communication standards and to make intentional choices for planning and instruction. That is our overall main goal for today. Um, and we are going to try and meet that through our objectives and success criteria. We have two objectives, which are to the, review the written and oral communications strand and to walk through a process to analyze and apply those indicators with precision. Um, we're going to be using that communications example. Okay. So that's going to be through the cross-check method. Left our success criteria um, to ensure we've met those objectives will be uh, to identify areas of the written and oral communication strand for focus, and then also to make a plan to review at least one indicator using the cross-check method. Um, and we'll return to the objectives and success criteria at the end to make sure that we have done what we said that we are going to do. As I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, we are in our fourth of four sessions on the cross-check method. Um, we have three previously recorded sessions on the cross-check method where we have gone through each of the four strands um, of the 2023 South Carolina College and Career Ready ELA standards. And with each of those sessions, we provided an example um, walking through the cross-check method with that strand um, in one particular grade band. So we have uh, the cross-check method with foundations of literacy, where we provided a K2 example, uh, cross-check method with applications of reading with an elementary example. Last week, we had the cross-check method with research, where we had a middle level example. And then today we are rounding that out with the cross-check method and communications where you'll get a high school example. So each of these is recorded. If you um, attended or registered for any of those previous webinars, you should have received the recording um, and you'll receive the recording today as well. But we are also gonna take all of these recordings and put them on our professional learning library, which will be posted on our website if you ever wanna get back to any of them. Um, but just know that the cross-check method can be applied across any of our um, strands and at any of those levels. We just wanted to give you um, some examples across those different ones so you could see the different ways it could be applied. So let's jump into some quick housekeeping, starting with some introductions. Uh, my name is Casey Prince Harvey. I am Education Associate for Humanities and ELA Support on the standards side of the Office of Assessment and Standards. And I am joined today by my awesome ELA colleagues. I have Mandy Hawker, who is our elementary ELA education associate, Tabitha Hughes, who is our middle level ELA education associate, and then Brenna McCormick, who is our high school ELA education associate. Um, and we have each taken turns uh, hosting these cross-check method webinars. So you should have seen each of us um, throughout those sessions if you have joined in. Um, but I would love to pause here and uh, see who we have in our virtual space today. So if you would please in the chat, just share your name, um, the district that you're coming from, uh, and if you wanna share your role as well. I know we might have some teachers, some coaches, some specialists, 
um, but take just a moment to drop that in the chat and uh, my colleagues will share some of that out. All right, we, we have um, a lot of high school people here today. Oh, uh, Richland too, Aaron Baker's here. Um, we see, I see a lot of reading coaches. I'm super excited about the um, secondary audience we have participating today. Um, we have Bamberg represented, Spartanburg 7, Fairfield. So we're all over the state. Um, thank you all for being with us this morning. Lots yeah. of familiar names as well. I like seeing people, uh, repeat attenders. Absolutely. That is so exciting to see a little bit of everyone from everywhere. And I'm definitely excited to see um, some secondary people here today uh, as we go through our high school examples. So That's very exciting. Uh, but again, if you did not attend any of our uh, three previous sessions on the cross check method and you were looking for an example at a different level, um, we will have those available to you. So fear not, you should get uh, a little bit of everything. A couple of other pieces of housekeeping. Uh, Brenna is going to drop our note catcher and attendance in the chat. Um, we do like to collect attendance so we know who we're serving around our state um, and where we have areas of support and where we might need to provide um, some additional support. So uh, completing that attendance would be very helpful if you could take a moment to do that. You also are receiving our note catcher um, you should have a copy. It'll make a copy that you can type directly on. Um, and when you see a pencil icon in the corner of the slide, that means that there is a section of your note catcher that corresponds to whatever information um, is on that slide, whether it's a prompt or it's a, a link to a resource. Um, so you do have that available to you to type on. Uh, and then we'll also kind of share out in the chat as well. Um, so just a second to make sure everyone has an opportunity to grab the note catcher and then the attendance. And then we'll jump on in. OK. So our agenda today is going to be very similar to um, our other cross check sessions. Uh, we are starting with an overview of written and oral communications doing a little bit of a dive into that strand. Then we'll move into the cross-check method and walk through the cross-check method using an example of um, an indicator from the written and oral communication strand. Um, and we're gonna use one at the high school level for today. And then we'll round out with clarity and closure. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and start with our overview of the written and oral communications strand. So written and oral communications, we have nine standards and nine indicators in the written and oral communications strand. Starting with our first three, those are going to be our three modes of writing. Uh, very similar to what you would have seen with the 2015 with C1, C2, C3 being the equivalent of your W1, W2, W3 in 2015. So um, argumentative writing, informative and expository writing, and then narrative writing. We then have our fourth standard on grammar and conventions. Um, if you have not had an opportunity to look at the grammar and conventions matrix, um, we do have a support document uh, specifically for communications for, um, so you can see those grade level expectations for grammar and conventions. Uh, standard five is going to be improving writing, and that is going to speak to both editing and revising, uh, much more clearly articulated and uh, defined in our glossary with the 2023 standards. Uh, standard six is going to be your handwriting standard. And then seven, eight, and nine are going to speak to um, your oral communications, your collaboration, your presenting um, through communicating ideas, collaboration and perspective and then evaluating ideas. If we look at that on our standards map, um, a little bit of a closer look here, again, you'll see those nine standards and nine indicators. And then that right-hand column is gonna show you the grade levels that are attached to each of those indicators. And what you will see is that all but one of those 
um, is going to stretch K through English 4 and is going to vertically progress. So it will be addressed across all grade levels. The only one that does not is that um, communication 6, that handwriting standard, which is going to be K through 5. Um, it does address both print and cursive writing. Um, and there is a vertical progression there that you can see. So you can see where handwriting um, is introduced in print and then cursive. But we want to take an opportunity for you to um, dive a little bit more into this strand. So Brenna is going to drop in the chat the vertical progression just for um, written and oral communications. This is going to give you all nine of those standards um, in that K through English 4 progression. So you can see where it's introduced um, in kindergarten and then how it progresses through each of the grade levels. And what we're going to do is a little something called wrap the strand. And you have a spot on your note catcher for this. This is box two of your note catcher. And what we want you to do is Take a moment to read and review um, some of that vertical progression. You may want to look at it across the board. You may want to focus in on, on a particular area. I'm going to let you choose your own adventure on that. Um, but as you're doing that, try and annotate for any new learning or big ideas. So what do you see there that might be different from what you may have seen in 2015? Um, what is something that's a big idea that really stands out to you or might align with um, what you're already doing? So any sort of new learning or big ideas. And then lastly, pick a standard and indicator that you might take a closer look at. So as you're reviewing everything, what is something that you might want to do a little bit of a deeper dive on? So we're going to take about 10 minutes here for you to get a good look at the written and oral communications strand and to wrap that strand um, in box two of your note catcher. So we'll say at 1051, we'll come back and share some of our takeaways. Okay, you can go ahead and get started.
We are almost at the five minute mark, just to give you a heads up in case you are annotating. Um, at about the two minute mark, I'll give you another heads up in case you want to add anything to the chat to share. We are just about at the two minute mark. So if there is anything that you want to add to the chat, whether it be um, new learning or big ideas or um, a standard indicator that you're thinking about taking a, a slightly closer look at, feel free to um, start formulating that response in the chat.
All right. Um, let's see any responses that um, have already been added to the chat. If you're still adding to the chat, um, that is absolutely fine. Mandy, can you share some of the responses that we've seen so far? Absolutely. So um, Dr. Platt talks about in English 2, C1.1, the um, inclusion of sufficient evidence as part of the indicator. Scrolling and then Christine Bradshaw, um, she was looking at the exact same words. Oh. Um, she explains that her class had really been working on that this year as well. Um, in English 3, C1.1, April Simmons talks about diction and syntax are used to link major sections of text. Um, then we have uh, someone in the chat mentioning um, an acknowledging an alternate perspective in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, English 2C 3.1, Avis Wesley mentioned it. Then we have um, first grade foundation standard 3.4, talking about a very specific language with decoding and enco encoding. Compared to the previous standard, yes, that is a huge shift in our foundation's indicators. Um, this, we have a fifth grade team um, who is working on how to combine the CER in science with argument writing standards. Oh, okay. I love that. All right. Very nice. Very nice. Wonderful. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I really like that idea of... Um, of using that claim evidence reasons in science and then building that into the argument writing piece. Um, we actually hosted a session in January on our overarching expectations with content connections um, as a way to sort of build in some of those connections to different content areas. So I'm really uh, happy to see that there are some, uh, there's some additional work being done around um, making connections across our content areas, uh, particularly with writing, fantastic. OK, um, well, let's share. I'm going to share a couple of our findings just uh, as we walked through um, that vertical progression for written and oral communications. Here were a couple of things that um, stood out to us. First, obviously, we, we do have nine standards and nine indicators. The handwriting standard is our only one um, that is K5. All of our other standards in written and oral communications are K through English 4. Um, so they are addressed at all grade levels. Writing instruction is paramount at all grade levels. So argumentative, informative, expository, and narrative um, all are addressed. And um, one additional piece that I like to address here is um, you're not going to see any language in any of those grade levels that the, the product that a student creates in any of those modes of writing has to be an essay. Um, it could be an infographic, it could be a pamphlet. Um, when you go into those grade level entrance statements um, for each of the grade levels in the standards document, you see some examples of uh, what written pieces might look like, um, but they can be beyond the bounds of uh, your traditional essay. But that writing instruction is still paramount um, across all levels. So writing in a variety of formats for a variety of purposes is an expectation for students at all grade levels. That goes back also to our overarching expectations. Um, overarching expectation one, for example, speaks to reading and writing in a variety of formats. Um, that's just an expectation for students at all levels um, all the time. Grammar and conventions, they are a standalone standard with communication for. Um, and they're essential to all modes of writing. So you, you won't necessarily see um, grammar embedded in certain modes of writing and not addressed in others because it is a standalone. Um, and that grammar and conventions matrix is a really helpful tool if you're wanting to see what the grade level expectation is um, for grammar instruction at your particular level. Revision and editing are both integral to the writing process. Um, this is something that is also outlined in our explanation of strands at the beginning of the standards document. Um, it's not so much that uh, students rewrite something in neater handwriting and they check it for grammar. Uh, that's not hitting that revision piece. So we want to be looking at revision just as much as we are um, at editing for that entire writing process. 
And then communication, um, because we call this written and oral communications, um, that is going to include oral, visual, and multimedia modes. And students are both creators and evaluators. So they should be creating their own pieces. They should be interacting and collaborating with one another, as well as evaluating the work of others. Um, so it's those two pieces do go hand in hand with written and oral communications. Um, the last piece here that I want to show is um, that P in the wrap the strand. If I were to select a standard and indicator for a deeper dive, um, I would pick, in this case, this is English 2 communication 1.1, which is write arguments to support claims in an analysis of a topic or text. And I'm going to take it a step further and I'm going to choose a sub indicator within that standard because we know there are multiple sub indicators when it comes to writing arguments um, that are going to take you through that whole process of creating the argumentative piece. But my piece that I want to do a deeper dive on is going to be sub indicator B, which is acknowledge and refute counterclaims with relevant evidence. And that's the piece that I'm going to focus in on um, today for our cross check method. And there are a few reasons why I selected this one. First, um, one thing that is new to our 2023 standards is uh, the shift in rhetoric from being introduced at the high school level to now being introduced at the middle school level. So I know that that information is going to be new for our middle level students, but that doesn't mean that I don't need to focus in on that and see how it's shifting and changing now at the high school level as well because the level of difficulty now increases with that skill and content being introduced earlier. So I need to take a deeper dive and look at that and see what that expectation is. And the other piece of that, the other piece and reason that I chose this is student need. Um, I'm speaking personally here from my background. I was a high school English teacher for the majority of my career. And I know that students, um, are great at creating their own claim and saying why they think they're right. But my English 2 students often struggle to look at that counterclaim and see from another person's perspective why they would argue something different from their own claim. So I want to take a moment to really focus in on them looking at that counterclaim and using that to strengthen their argument. Um, so that's why I chose uh, that piece just from a you know, just from a practical experience standpoint. So let's stop and jot here. I want us to think about what we've seen so far with the written oral communication strand as you did that deeper dive. When we think about this new strand, I want you to consider the impact that it could have on student learning in our state. When we think about students developing as readers and writers and communicators um, and evaluators of communication, what impact could this have if we were to um, provide instruction around this strand with fidelity? Take a moment to consider what that might look like. What would students do as a result? Um, feel free to add it to the chat. You also have a spot in your note catcher, but I'd love to hear um, what impact do you think this could have? Again, feel free to add to the chat. I would love to see your responses if you're comfortable with sharing them.
some of the answers we're seeing in the chat, Casey, are that we're building confidence in students, being able to communicate in a variety of ways. We have confident writers. We have stronger communication skills, which tell me that's not a workforce ready skill, right? Being able to communicate effectively and appropriately. Um, helping students to become independent thinkers. I love that. Jim Harris mentions that. Um, and be able to defend their point of view and persuade others. And how necessary is that in the day of social media, right? Where we can all have an opinion, but can we defend it? And do we have reasons? <laughs> um, encouraging students to look at both sides of an argument and checking the credibility of sources. Um, we have so much conviction for those indicators um, and the importance of those in relevant to our society today. Absolutely. Colleges. Oh, I love this. This is really good, Casey. Colleges would deeply appreciate students having these skills established. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of which, I think there's so much here that you've said that we could lay over the profile of the South Carolina graduate and see those clear connections because these really are um you know, those life skills to be an effective communicator, um, to be able to look at different arguments from multiple angles, um, to use relevant and credible evidence to support um, your claims, uh, just to be able to think critically about the arguments that you see around you. Absolutely. And confident writers um, and confident speakers, confident presenters, um, because we know, again, that um, the way that we communicate, uh, written, orally, multimedia, um, it's going to look different depending on the context and and the need, like your task, your purpose, your audience. Um, so opening that up as well beyond the bounds of a five paragraph essay um, can help to build those confident writers and communicators as well. I love that. Um, so as we're thinking about that, what instructional shifts do you think will need to take place in order to make these things happen? So look at some of what was already shared. What could happen as a result of um, this strand being implemented with fidelity? What instructionally will have to take place in order to make those things happen? Again, love to see some responses in the chat. Oh, writing will have to be taught. Can't be pushed to the side. It's not the dessert, right? It's not the dessert at the end of the meal. Opportunities for students to share and collaborate. Yeah, absolutely. And that can be a little scary too, because that means that, um, in a lot of ways, a teacher has to take a step back and let the students take ownership of those discussions and those collaboration opportunities. Um, absolutely. Writing across content, I love that. Read, write, talk, and repeat. Excellent, I love that. And these things go hand in hand, right? It's, it's not that there has to be, um, you know, reading separate from writing. There are ways that we can intentionally put these things together. Modeling what good writers do. I love that. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of that, modeling what good writers do, uh, think about your communication five, which is revision and editing. Sometimes modeling what good writers do is modeling that revision process and showing them the messy work of revising. Remember, when they're reading an author's work, they're reading the finished product. They're reading the polished piece. So unless they get the practical experience of revising and you modeling that revising process, um, they're only ever going to see the, the finished work. And that can make writing a little intimidating. See, writing is a daily practice. Careful with collaboration prevent students from, yeah. So, um, and that is one thing, and I saw that definitely at the high school level as well. If you do have them collaborate, sometimes it can be a little scary to take an opinion that is separate from what the group says. So encouraging them to still, you know, have their own opinion and to think critically about the arguments of others um, is a very important skill to continue developing. All right. Well, that was a um, pretty 
intense overview of our written and oral communication strand. Um, but as we've done that dive and looked at some key pieces, um, I'm going to take that piece that I shared with you previously and use that to walk through our cross check method. Um, and if you've attended any of our previous sessions, you're going to see some of this is quite similar. We're trying to align all of this um, so you can see that process across the different strands. Um, but we're going to take it uh, through the lens of our written and oral communications today. So we're going to start with our description of the cross check method and in box four of your note catcher or in the chat, uh, I want you to share the words that draw your attention. I'm going to just put it on the screen. I'm not going to read it to you, um, but take a moment to take a look and share in the chat or on your note catcher any words or phrases that draw your attention. Mandy, can you share some of the responses? Sure. I see um, success criteria and intentional, 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 intentional indicator aligned, rigor, questioning, um, instructional partners. I love that. Mm. Informed. Absolutely. And I love that. Um, as a group, we're focusing in on intentional. Um, if you've been to any of our previous sessions, you know we love some intentionality. Everything should be purposeful um, when we are building a plan um, for providing instruction for our students. Um, so the cross-check method is um, a way of looking at um, individual indicators to really break down and ensure we understand the intent of those indicators and then use that to build a plan for um, that instruction uh, and then assessing. So this is um, quite a lengthy process. It is something that really is a deep, deep dive into that indicator. Um, so as we walk through it, you will see um, this is one that's really helpful for um, indicators that you feel you need a much closer look at, uh, ones where there might be a shift or new information. Um, but Possibly not uh, one that you would do for every single indicator since it is so lengthy, um, but we'll talk about some ways that you can maybe build out a plan if there are multiple indicators that you do want to walk through this process with. So our cross check method. Um, this is an acronym um, that we developed uh, within our team for implementing indicators and it stands for content and skills, rigor and questioning, objectives, success criteria and assessment, sequence of mini lessons, and then check for alignment and reflect. And each of these is a step in the process um, of really diving into that indicator and then making that plan. So real quick, I want you to pause and ponder. Uh, what do you think is the most important step in this process and why? And how does this align with how you already plan? Um, are there connections that you can make to what you already do? Uh, so take a moment again to drop in the chat um, what you think might be the most important step for you personally in this process or how you can align this with what you already do. see objectives, assessment, criteria and alignment. 
objective success criteria assessment, rigor and questioning, alignment and reflect. Success criteria helps steer the rigor and questioning throughout the lessons. Okay, focus on the level of the challenge and how the questioning contributes to the rigor. Oh, and I like that. It makes you think of beginning with the end in mind. Absolutely. So um, when we think about this process, and that's a, a good segue there, uh, beginning with the end in mind, you can think about this um, and sort of the template as three separate pieces of one plan, um, those being the destination, the map, and then the check and reflect. So knowing where we want to go, figuring out how to get there, and then those checks along the way to make sure that every step we take helps us to get to that destination. So when we think about the destination, those are going, um, these pieces of the cross-check method really are gonna align with that destination piece. So the content and skills, the rigor and questioning, the objectives and the success criteria and assessment, right? That's the where we want to go. The steps along the way are gonna be the sequence of the many lessons um, that we develop to meet those goals. And just a note here that your instructional series, um, so those many lessons can include as many or as few uh, lessons as necessary to fully address the content, skills, and rigor of your indicator. And it's gonna depend on which indicator you pick. Um, in our case today, we're gonna look at one sub-indicator of something much bigger. But if you attended our research webinar last week, Brenna actually pulled multiple indicators and combined them. So it's really going to depend on what you're looking at. Um, and that will then determine what your goals are going to be for that indicator and then how many lessons uh, you need to plan along the way. And then you have the check and reflect, which is checking for alignment. Um, this is after the development of the instructional series. So are all of these steps going to meet the mark? And then the reflection after you've implemented the instructional series. So thinking back about what next steps might need to take place, what went well, um, or what additional supports may be needed. So all of those pieces together help us to uh, create our cross-check method. And we're gonna look at a communications example today, high school communications example. Box six of your note catcher should have a link to this as we walk through it. Um, it is there for you uh, just for your reference. So we're starting with um, the C in our cross check, which is the content and skills, where I've selected the standard and then the indicator. So our overall end of academic learning expectation here that we've selected is C1, which is write arguments to support claims with clear reasons and relevant evidence. Uh, when I look at the grade level indicator I want to focus in on, um, I've got English 2 C1.1. So that's write arguments to support claims in an analysis of a topic or text. And when writing, I'm focusing in on one specific sub indicator here, which is acknowledge and refute counterclaims with relevant evidence. That is just the piece that I'm doing the dive on today. And we talked a little bit about the reasoning why behind that. But I really want to break down the content and the skills that are related to that indicator. So when I look at the language of the indicator, I want to figure out what students really are expected to know and do. And then the content, as in the nouns in that indicator language, and then the skills, the verbs. Uh, so I've pulled a few pieces from that indicator, and I've included the definitions for those from our glossary. Um, and I've done that very intentionally because our glossary was crafted to align to the language of our indicators. It is um, really a, um, a specifically crafted glossary. So under content, I've pulled three pieces. I've pulled argument, right, because students are writing arguments um, along with the definition. I've then pulled counterclaim with its definition and then also evidence. Then I've pulled for skills, I've pulled refute because that's going to be that big piece in that sub indicator um, to refute that counterclaim. So again, you see here um, the content and the skills with the glossary definition 
And we also have a link to the standards glossary here to help with any unfamiliar um, words or concepts. So once I've broken down the essential content and skills for this indicator, I wanna think about the rigor of that indicator and the questioning that might be necessary um, to support the critical thinking around that indicator. So I wanna look at the expectation for rigor, what the DOK level might be, um, and then think about some of those questions. Um, and we'll talk about text-dependent questioning and collaborative discussion questions in just a moment from here. Uh, but if I'm just looking at the language of that indicator and really that sub-indicator, I'm gonna call that a DOK level three because students are gonna be expected to complete multiple tasks sequentially. So they are gonna to have to create their own claim in order to also understand and explain the counterclaim. So first they need to create the claim, then they need to understand and explain a counterclaim. And then the last piece there is gonna to be to use evidence and reasoning to refute. When we think about that level um, and what students are gonna to need to do in order to successfully meet that, uh, we really need to think about questioning and the questions that are gonna support and encourage that critical thinking. What we know from our South Carolina uh, Teaching Standards 4.0 rubric is that questioning is the area of highest need um, based on the data that's collected um, through that 4.0 rubric and evaluations. So we can address that through two types of questioning, our collaborative discussion questions and our text dependent questions. Collaborative discussion questions being ones that guide students to engage in conversation um, about text. It allows for ideas to be presented, defended, elaborated upon, responded to. So things like, what is your first reaction? Um, what does the text help you think about? So these are uh, discussion questions that would happen, you know, within your group of students. Um, we might call them indicator adjacent. But then we also have our text dependent questions, which are gonna require students to provide evidence directly from the text and their answers. And the language of those TDQs are gonna be directly aligned to indicators. So that's gonna be your indicator language. Um, how does the author's choice of words shape the tone of the text? How does the author's use of personification impact the meaning? How does the setting impact the conflict? So these are really two different types of questioning, but they're both essential to encourage that critical thinking. And when you think about your collaborative discussion questions, they really are a scaffold into your text dependent questions. You use your CDQs to build into your TDQs. So how do we bridge that gap? With an intentional indicator aligned plan for scaffolding question, questioning. So I'll show you an example here. Uh, let's say that we're looking at seventh grade AOR 1.2, which is analyze how figurative language impacts mood, tone, and meaning. If I were to create a TDQ, which is a text dependent question um, from that indicator, it might look like, how does the author's use of figurative language impact the tone of the text? What words or phrases in that TDQ might be a little bit tricky for students? What here might be a little bit rigorous or uh, might be some areas that are sticky points? Yes, I'd love to see some responses in the chat. Okay. Oh, I see impact used a good bit. Okay. Absolutely. So I've pulled a couple of pieces here, potentially figurative language, because it's um, it's kind of a broad term. We've got impact, then we've got tone. So those might be a little bit tricky. And so one way that we can build into that TDQ is through some CDQs, like how does this text make you feel? What words make you feel that way? So these are going to be those questions that are indicator language adjacent. So they're going to hit mood and tone um, and author's word choice, but not necessarily using the indicator language. And we can use that to build in. Same thing with did your feelings change at any point in the story? What made them change? And that's going to hit tone and impact. And then where does the author make an exaggeration? 
How does that exaggeration make you feel? Again, hitting tone and figurative language. So let's look at that through the lens of the sub indicator that I previously chose. So a text dependent question might be, how would you argue a claim and acknowledge and refute a counterclaim on this topic? Right, that's gonna be that indicator specific language. But some CDQs that I might use, some collaborative discussion questions might be, what are your thoughts on this topic? Which side would you take on this? Do you agree or disagree and why? Right, each of those is gonna help the students establish a claim, but it's not using the word claim. Um, for evidence, what information would you use to support your thinking? Uh, for counterclaim, it might be something like, what might an opposite or opposing view on this be? And then for refute, we could use a question like, how would you show the other person's thinking is incorrect? So these are just some examples of some collaborative discussion questions that help to build into the text dependent question. And it's important to note here that none of this language is necessarily new at this grade level, but it is a refresher for students. We want to still provide that support into the TDQ. For objectives, so now that I know the questions, now that I know um, the rigor, I know the content and skills, I want to create an objective um, for what students will need to understand and be able to do to independently answer that TDQ. So my learning objective here is going to be um, that students will be able to establish a claim while acknowledging and refuting a counterclaim with evidence. And that again is indicator aligned. It's gonna use that indicator language. But then I need to create my success criteria. So um, what will students do in order to demonstrate that they have mastered that, that they've done what they um, have set out to do? And uh, then how will I assess that? So what I have here is a sample of what an assessment might be for that. So in this case, I'm gonna have students individually read two texts with opposing views on a similar topic, and then they're gonna write an argument in which they establish a claim for which text or view they agree with. They're gonna identify and explain a counterclaim using evidence from the text or text, and then they're gonna refute the counterclaim using evidence from the text or text. So that's my end goal, right? Um, but again, that's going to help build into that objective. And how do I get there? I get there through my sequence of mini lessons. So here's where we're going to plan out how many days of mini lessons we might need, how we're going to address each aspect of the indicator, and how we'll equip students to answer that TDQ. So we'll look at an example here. So let's say that I've planned out four mini lessons. And in this case, I'm showing you the second of the four mini lessons. So for this mini lesson, I'm just going to focus on counterclaim. So we're going to say the day before um, we worked on building your claim, right? That was the first piece. So day one, they built the, P, the claim. Now for day two, we're starting with our connection. Over the last couple days, uh, we worked on looking at some interesting topics and developing a claim. Now we're going to revisit those and we're going to think about them from a different lens. So today what we're going to do is go back to some claims that they already established. Um, and for this, they're going to be using something called hot topics, which is essentially um, where you provide students with kind of some this or that questions. Um, and they're really kind of surface level, Apple or Android, Clemson or Carolina, um, whatever you really want them to be. But the idea is for students to be able to establish a claim based on um, whatever that topic is. So let's say that they established their claim the previous day, and now we're going back. There we go. Okay, so what they're going to do this day is we're going to pick one of those claims that they created the day before, and we're going to put it up on chart paper or on the board. Um, then we're going to use some of those CDQs about counterclaim to help create one counterclaim statement. So we might use something like if someone were to disagree with this thinking, what would they say and why? Or what might an opposite or opposing view on this be? And we're going to discuss that as a class, just on this one claim. So let's say the day before someone created a claim that Apple is better than Android. Right now we're going to look at it from that opposite angle. If someone said Android was better than Apple, why would they say that? 
And we're going to use those responses together to craft a statement as a class just on one claim. And then at the end, we want to explain to students that these pieces, when put together, create your claim and counterclaim. Even though they should already be familiar with this language because it's not new to this grade level, we still want to name it. To demonstrate understanding after we've done that as a class, um, students can work with a partner to take an additional hot topic claim from the previous day and work through those same CDQs to create a counterclaim statement on um, a new topic and then invite them to share their responses. To reflect, we'll ask students um, to consider why it's important to consider a topic um, and argument from multiple angles. So what's the impact of that? And how might this skill be helpful outside of the ELA classroom? And then lastly, we check for our alignment. Um, so checking for alignment, we want to see if all steps are in alignment with our chosen indicator, um, what additional resources we might need, who else we might need to bring into that conversation. Um, I know some people mentioned special populations earlier. So in this case, I've said assessment for this is formative. It's going to align with the intent of the indicator. Uh, this is a sub indicator. That's the other piece. This is just one piece of a much larger standard. Um, so I know that students are going to need additional opportunities to explore and learn about all aspects of argumentative writing. I'm just focusing in on this one piece today because I know it's a need that students have. Um, for the hot topics, I might need to adjust or alter the options uh, based on student interests, needs, and background knowledge. So here I'm using Carolina versus Clemson um, because I know that's a hot topic, but if I'm somewhere else in a different district or at a different level, I might need to change what those topics are. And then to reflect as a next step, um, I may revisit the hot topics, same thing, and have students then refute the counterclaims that they made. So that might be my next day activity. And that way they've built the claim, the counterclaim, and then refuted the same piece all the way through. Um, and I may need to consult my ML or SPED teachers um, in the building for support based on student need. So if I see a particular need um, based on those couple of days, I might need to go reach out to someone. So that was a lot. <laughs> um, and that is uh, kind of why I said earlier, this is uh, a process that you might want to do with one particular indicator or um, ones where you see a major shift or new learning um, or where there might need to be a deeper dive. Um, maybe not one that you do with every single indicator. But um, we do have resources to support um, that cross-check method. So box seven of your note catcher should have a link to a wakelet, um, which is going to be uh, a series of resources on the cross-check method that you're welcome to go back to, um, you know, and refer to, as well as the recordings for all of these sessions. So there are resources available um, if you're starting to work on this process. And that leads us to clarity and closure. I want you to consider three steps forward. Um, I know you kind of did this earlier, but um, explore those resources. Take an opportunity to look at that vertical progression again. Take an opportunity to look at the example um, or the wakelet uh, to see where you might want to focus in. Decide who you could partner with in this work. Maybe there's um, someone on your team. You could each take a different indicator and work through this process and build out a sequence of mini lessons um, that could be shared within your department or your team. And then again, choose one indicator to start with. Um, one step forward is um, you know, a good way to think about it. And if you do start with an indicator, um, in the next week or so, and you have questions or you want feedback, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to um, partner with you on this work um, and kind of walk through that process with you. So just think about those three steps forward. Again, our purpose for today um, was to improve understanding of the written and oral communication standards and make intentional choices for planning and instruction. We had two objectives and two success criteria. So I just want to loop back and see, did we meet our goals for today? Did we do everything that we set out to do? I hope so. <laughs> 
um, feel free. You can put a yes in the chat or a no if, if it was a no or just a thumbs up just to see um, did we do everything that we said we were going to do. And then to close us out, we are going to um, drop the link in for our feedback survey. Um, Brenna's going to drop in that link. And um, our feedback survey is very helpful to us to see what went well, where we might need to follow up for additional support. Um, any feedback that you have on the relevance of this session and its actionability um, would be greatly appreciated. We do take that into consideration. Other than that, um, we're going to listen and linger for just a few minutes. Um, but uh, that is all we have for you today and the recording. Uh, once we get it through accessibility and get posted on um, our YouTube page, we will be um, sharing the recording and the resources back with you. Um, so you should see that a little bit later on this week. Okay. Like I said, we'll listen and linger, but we thank you so much for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.